If you're a guest this morning, and all of you, go ahead and make your way to Acts chapter 2. It'll become familiar territory over the next few weeks. If you're a guest this morning, we're so glad you've joined us. This isn't, this isn't the big surprise. This is just another teaser surprise. I have good news for you. For guests, this is also, this would be applicable for members too. Over the last 20 years, sociological studies have shown that those who attend church regularly have lower blood pressure, happier outlooks on life, better marriages, less divorce, and live longer. So you couldn't have picked a better place to be today. This, this is a great place to be in God's house on God's day. And I want to talk to you today about the church. And, at a, and I told you a couple weeks ago, there are a few things I'm really passionate about in this world, but I am passionate about the church because it's it's called the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. The Bible says Jesus died for the church. The more you love Jesus, the more you're going to love the church and be devoted to it. And that's what we're going to lean into over these next few weeks together. Now, I want you to have an appreciation for the church, what it is, what it's about. And I want to tell you a picture of what God plans for a church to be like, to look like. And it comes from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. In Acts 2, the church is born. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes in power upon the people of God. Great and mighty things begin to take place in Jerusalem in that first church. And here's what it says in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Over the next five Sundays, we're going to break that out into the details of it. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. 2,000 years ago, there was a carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus who burst onto the scene. And he had this vision that would come to change the world. Everywhere he went, Jesus inspired hearts and imaginations with what was possible as he painted this beautiful picture of, of, a, of a spiritual, a spiritual, uh, the uh, vertical, a relational, a horizontal vision, a movement like none that had ever ex ex existed before. And his teachings just captured the hearts of people at such a high level that they would go without food in order to hear this message, to hear about a God that wasn't just far off in heaven, but a God that was personal, that lived not just at some house of worship. He's a God who lived in their hearts, close and real and powerful, and they thronged to hear Jesus talk about this phenomenon that he referred to as the kingdom of God. Jesus explained, this kingdom, it's amazing. It's like, a, it's like a mustard seed. The tiny little seed doesn't seem really big and significant and impactful on the front end. And yet, it grows and it grows and it develops and develops until one day, one day, it is awesome and incredible and a blessing. What Jesus envisioned was so valuable that, that he encouraged children to come to it. Not just, this wasn't just an adult something. It was for children. He, he called out to the poor and the poor in spirit to come and hear this message. He, he, he wanted to engage those who were rich that they would, they would see how great this thing was. This kingdom of God that, that they'd be willing to give up everything. That they'd be willing to give up everything they own to enter into it. The good news, Jesus said, the good news of the kingdom, it must be preached. It's not something that can be preached that you could talk about. It must be proclaimed. And people would travel for miles around to hear him talk about it. For three years, Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom. And then, to the shock, the devastation of those who loved him and had heard him and followed him, he was arrested by his enemies. 
He was beaten. He was crucified. And he was dead. And it seemed that the hopes of this kingdom had all been lost. That every hopeful follower now had nowhere to turn. They'd envisioned Jesus delivering them from this corrupt and oppressive Roman rule. Establishing a political kingdom with him as the king over this kingdom of God. And and now he was gone. But three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead, miraculously, victoriously, defeating sin and defeating death. And he announced this kingdom, this kingdom vision was as alive as he was. And he opened their minds to see that this kingdom that he's been teaching them about is not some earthly kingdom, not some castle with him sitting on a throne in that earthly castle, but this was the reign of God in people's hearts, and it was a reality, and it was God close and powerful. Jesus walked the earth, taught his disciples, interacted with them, and then he ascended back into heaven, but he promised them. Acts 1.8, he promised them that the Holy Spirit would come in power. When we get to the first chapter of Acts, and then the second chapter of Acts, we see the stirrings in chapter 1, the movement in chapter 1, and then the reality in chapter 2 is the Holy Spirit falls on this mustard seed little gathering of frightened followers of Jesus. And it's birthed in a whole new, fresh way. Powerful and compelling, and people from everywhere, across culturally, across socioeconomic lines, it reaches everybody in a whole new way, and they're drawn to it. This new movement is called the church, and there was nothing that had ever been like it before. God, God moving in this new and exciting way. In that very first church, the people devoted themselves to some key things, to to teaching, to fellowship, to celebrating the Lord's Supper, praying together, all the things we just read. The atmosphere of welcome and excitement was so electric that that people were drawn to it like a magnet. And there was a sense of awe and wonder whenever they met. And the Bible records there were miracles that took place among those people, that, that signs and wonders accompanied the people of God. And they had one of the biggest miracles, this love they had for each other. That it wasn't just, yeah, those those are the people I go to church with. But they were in this together and in this deep together, in the details of life. In the big stuff, in the little stuff, they were together. They were the church. They loved each other so much, they were willing to do whatever they needed to do to help one another, including, in their case, they sold what they had in order to make sure everybody had what they needed. And there were so many people who were so poor, so many people who were disenfranchised because they'd committed their lives to Christ. They were the safety net to protect and care for those who had stepped away from their lifetime religions to join with Jesus. This new thing called the church was so compelling. The Bible says that the people of the church, they they met every day. And sometimes they met at the temple in larger gatherings, and they were meeting day to day in homes where it was a smaller, more intimate, the fellowship side of that, the know you, love you, help you through life kind of stuff was taking place. And the best part of the story is this picture that Jesus had painted was, was ringing true. That the members of of this church, they they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God for letting them be a part of this amazing movement. And they enjoyed favor with the entire city. A city that had been opposed to them. Now, the city's looking saying, there's something so different about them. So revolutionary about them. So dynamic about them. That it was irresistible. And it was contagious. And, and, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because people wanted to be a part of something like this. Something so eternal. Something so supernatural. All a part of this vision that Jesus had preached about, prayed about, and died for. And that's what we read in Acts chapter 2. And that's what God envisions for church. And I recognize, I recognize we don't always get this right. And I recognize that most people don't even expect it to be like this anymore. I have, maybe I haven't told many of you. So I've made multiple 
trips now to the African continent. You know why I go? Some people, oh, I think you may, you may be thinking about becoming a missionary to Africa. No, I'm not. I, I love being a pastor right here in one of the spiritually hardest places in the world. One of the, nothing personal against you people. But the reason that I have to go back regularly is because I have been privileged to drop into the middle of this. There. Where this is what it looks like when, when you do church. Where the dynamic is so overwhelming, the, the movement of God so powerful. To be reminded of some things that I, I think we forget that God's, God's not through doing this. This isn't a... a ancient history story. This is a story, again, there are more people coming to Christ. Revival is burning hotter in the world right now than it has ever burnt in the history of Christianity. Just not here. But in Africa, China, in a lot of places, oh my goodness, I I got a story came came out yesterday from Egypt where Christians are being persecuted severely and God is working dramatically in the lives of people. Lost people are being saved in record numbers in Egypt. God's not nearly done with his work. Now here's what I want to tell you. Think about this. And this is this is the way I've been saying it for a while. There once existed a people. Acts chapter 2. There once existed a people radically devoted to Christ, irrevocably committed to one another, and relentlessly dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with their friends and their neighbors and their enemies and their world. Now, I want to ask you some questions. If such a people once existed, do we believe First, do we believe God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? You believe that? Okay. Do we believe that anything God has ever done, He can still do? I hope so. Do do we believe that anything God has ever done anywhere, He can do here? I hope so. Do we believe that anything God has ever done in anyone, He can do in you? Say, well, I'm not sure about that. He can. Anything he's ever done in anyone, he can do in me. He can do in you. Does Jesus Christ still redeem and restore people? Are the scriptures still as sharp as a two-edged sword? And if so, why can't there be a community of faith like this in our city in our day? How does God, how how does a church become like that church in Acts chapter 2? What we find in them, we find it in the second chapter of Acts, and we find them living it out throughout the rest of their story, is that they were, they were pursuing five core devotion focuses that you implement these things that can make any church compelling, powerful, influential. So I want you to listen to this because I really think, I really think that this is still possible. I think it's possible here and And I'd like for us to lean into it. And that's why I have asked all of you to lean into this over the next 30 days. To do this together. Because, see, being the church, being the church like they were the church is more than, I have some friends at church. See, being the church like this is more than, I love my my friends or my class or my age group or my basic demographic. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the church at this level. This is the church where, where, our, where our students really, really care and are engaged in caring about our oldest adults. And our oldest adults are really engaged in caring about our preschoolers and what's happening over there in that area of ministry and those preschoolers' parents. And it's, it's not just a part of it. It's in a multi-generational setting like ours. It's all of us caring about everybody. That's what makes the church the church. And that's what we want to lean into in these days. What made the church so compelling? And this really outlines where we're going to be headed over the next few weeks They committed, there you have an outline there. They committed to authentic, real, devoted community. Community. In Jerusalem, the people, they weren't playing games with with church. You know how this is. You can be in a group and 
you say, hey, how's everybody doing? And everybody goes, let me get, let me get my mask on. Ah, I'm all good. Everything's great at my house. No problems here. Everyone's doing fine. Uh, we're all uh, wonderful. Well, that's really, that's really not often true. That means that uh, to get to real community, you're going to have to sometimes be who you really are and uh, be willing to let people know about that so that we can grow together. You know, wouldn't it be great? And some of you have experienced this. I've experienced this. It's my favorite part of church. Some of you, you say, man, I wish it just once in my life there was a group of people who were, were in that group. I was, I was really known and loved and served and celebrated for who I am. They'll, they'll take me the way I am. And they love me too much to leave me where I am. I wish I could just be a part of a group like that where I was leaning into it at that level. And the church is where you experience relationships the way relationships were meant to be experienced. And how did they do that? And that word devoted is so key to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to community. Devoted is not a word we use often, is it? Because we're not devoted to much. We're casually engaged uh, lightly interested in stuff, but devoted to one another is something we're not very good at. We'll, we'll be interested until it's difficult, until, it's, until we have to do something. We're uh, all about loving one another. That's not what they were doing here. It is hard for us to devote ourselves to anything because we're so distracted by lesser things. You look at uh, Michael Phelps over the course of the uh, Olympic runs for him devoted himself to, self to swimming, and as a result, record number of Olympic medals. Bill Gates devoted himself to making a lot of money at Microsoft. And he's using that money to cure diseases around the world in dramatic ways that are impacting uh, large portions of the unhelped, uh, under-resourced world. Billy Graham's devotion to preaching the gospel to, of Jesus Christ led him to almost every country in the world over the course of a lifetime of sharing Jesus. Devotion is a good thing. You put a church full of people together who have full devotion, loving one another, that organization is going to impact in a dramatic way a city or a nation or, or the world. And you know, Jesus said, by this they'll know you're my disciples. Not by your buildings, not by uh, your great teaching, not by your great music, not by your... By this they'll know you're my disciples. The people out there will know the people in here are my disciples if you love one another. That's what Jesus said. The community part of it is what people are starved for, and it's attractive, and it's engaging, and that's what he's called us to be about. That's what a church is. The church, energized by the Holy Spirit, motivated by this relational commitment to one another, has the power to change lives like nothing else on earth. It, it is, it's already a part of who we are. You don't have to go to a bunch of classes to figure out how to do this. It's not a big theological uh, debate system. It's loving people like Jesus told us to love people, like he modeled for us. And today, on a Sunday, two billion people around the world name the name of Christ because of the fellowship. Second, they gave themselves, devoted themselves to wholehearted worship. Our nation is incredibly gifted at worship. Not, not worship of God, worship of everything else. But we're, we're worshipers, absolutely. Uh, I mean, think about, think about where we are right now. It's the beginning of football season. Oh, man. A lot of us waited a long, hot summer for this to come. Uh, and many of you, you were living and dying yesterday with your college football teams. You know where I was yesterday? Thrill of victory, agony defeat. I was in Stillwater, Oklahoma for the game yesterday. Those of you who kept up with the madness that was uh, the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. Uh, so yeah, thrill of victory, agony defeat. And today... The, I have to do the two versions of this. We, we videotape, you know, and we put this out, so I have to do two versions of it. As of right now, the Dallas Cowboys are undefeated in 2016. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, now we've got to do the second take, just in case I need to use a different version. They'll edit this in. 
The Dallas Cowboys have not been mathematically eliminated from the playoffs as of today. Okay, for the camera, we're all covered. All right. The response that we have to sporting events is a is appreciate and nothing appreciate your team, cheer for your team, be enthusiastic for your favorite team, at whatever level of uh, of sport. It's saying we, we're what great job, we're pulling for you, we're in worship, as the Bible defines worship, is about giving God what He rightly deserves. About acknowledging him for his, who he is and what he has done. Worship is mentioned in Romans. We'll spend some time with this in the series. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, the totality of your being, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. One of the things that made the first church so attractive is its members all possess this acute understanding that, and this is where worship breaks down for us, God made them. They had breath. They had their daily bread. Everything came from God, and they started acknowledging, this is how this works. It's all from God. It, and when you see God's, God's God, and you start living that out, it changes how you worship. Worship is not driven by the form that we try to build into and encourage it. Worship comes from a heart that's grateful to God, that loves God. And when our worship falters, it's because we're not grateful to God and we do not love God all that much. They assemble for worship every week and they devoted themselves. It says to the, the breaking of bread into prayer, which the Lord's Supper was a part of this, and they didn't take it for granted. It wasn't just, oh yeah, I'll do that again. Not, they weren't seeing, this is just a religious ritual. But they were engaged at the heart level. Devoted at the heart level. And, and they prayed. And when someone needed prayer, they, brothers and sisters laid hands on them and they prayed. And they expected that great and awesome things, signs and wonders would take place when they prayed. They prayed God would come through because they didn't have anywhere else to turn. And God came through. Acts 2.47 says they were praising God. Worshiping God, who He is, what He had done for them. And when God answered their prayers, He got all the credit for it. They didn't say, well, that worked out well. Boy, that was lucky. They said, God did that. The church is where God gets the glory He deserves. Why don't you turn to someone next to you and say, the church is where God gives the, gets the glory He deserves. God gets the glory He deserves. That's where the church is. All right. That was terrible. Number three. <laughs> I'm not done. You get another chance. Number three, they took their spiritual growth seriously. And I get this from Acts 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. When they were teaching, when, they were, when there was a learning opportunity, they were learning. When there was a growth opportunity, they were growing. They were dialed in. And why is that? Because in that church, they believed spiritual growth was important. Jesus had touched them so deeply that they wanted to become like Jesus. Anything they could do, anywhere they could do, they wanted to become more like Jesus. And so they were going to take that step. And spiritual growth is not mind information. It's not another, another Bible trivia game. Spiritual growth is becoming more like Jesus in his character, in his ways, in his will. And if you're going to be growing, there's going to be things you're going to be doing to become like Jesus. And the reason we're sitting here in this place and we're on this earth, the church is a hot house for spiritual growth. Lots of people take their golf game or their bank account or their career seriously. But the most important thing, this relationship with God is often neglected. And the reason why it's neglected is because we're not intentional about it. We're not leaning into it. We think somehow it's just going to happen magically that we're going to grow spiritually. The truth is... Giving yourself to spiritual growth brings great payoff. The Apostle Paul said, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life, but also for the life to come. That's a lot of payoff. The church is where, this is one way to say, the church is where you become the best you you can be. The you that God created you to be. That, that, this, is, this is the environment where that has greatest opportunity to take place. So I want you to look at the person next to you. This is your next chance. Look at the person next to you for a minute 
And I want you to raise your hand if you think, the person sitting next to me could get better. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that, that really got ugly, didn't it? Uh, sorry. I, there's a lot of things about relations. Jimmy will come back and do some stuff on marriage to try to clean that up for us. Okay. Second opportunity to raise your hand. How many of you think you could get better? Yeah. And those of you didn't raise your hands because you're liars. And so we'll do a sermon about the truth and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we'll get that cleaned up on your end. None of us have arrived. We all need to grow, don't we? That's, that's why God made the church, so you could be with God and with His people to learn and to grow and to become His will, His ways. And, and that's why we're, we're issuing this uh, Be the Church Challenge. And we're, we're using uh, this, this little book. We've already, we have, Ross told me this morning, we have sold us record numbers of this. A lot more, we had to reorder. We'll probably have to reorder again. This is a fantastic devotional book. Our staff is now four weeks into this. We're going to take on the next week tomorrow because we wanted to go through this ahead of the rest of the church. And we have been amazed at what God's been doing in us and the challenges we have had in reading this book. It has been fantastic. And you're going to be so blessed by this and really exceeding expectations on our end at every turn. So you don't want to miss out on this. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So here's what we want to do. We, we're going to show up and we're going to grow up to become what God wants us to be. Here's the fourth thing. In Acts chapter 2, they invested in positive priorities. They invested their time. They invested their talents. They invested their resources in things that were going to make a difference, things that really mattered. So here's this church, and they had this sense of community. And they had a sense of gratitude and love for God. And, and they had a desire to become more like their Savior. And it says, you know, all believers had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, giving as anyone might have need. Here's what that shows. That they had enough control of their time and their talents and their resources. It wasn't going to a thousand other lesser things, but it was focused in on the eternal things. And they had enough margin in their life, because this is part of it. We talked about, we talked about Sabbath last week. And we work right up against the edge of our time, our talent, and our resources. And then when God presents an opportunity for ministry, for caring for others, we don't have any space for that in our schedule. And so we just drive right on by. We pass right on by. We, we dismiss the opportunities that God presents to us. These folks... They were building in the margin. They were giving it opportunity. And man, when, when there was a need, they said, I think I can, I can help out. I think I have enough margin. I have enough I can carve off of my stuff, my time, my abilities to, to be able to invest in other people. These people in the first church decided, uh, we're just not going to live on the edge of our margins all the time. And they got control of this stuff in a way they could give to positive priorities. And they live with this anticipation. And this is the part, they live with an anticipation that Jesus could come at any moment. That changes how you, I, I, hear, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, connected to the election. I see, I see it in print. I see it, oh man, I wish Jesus would just come again so I wouldn't have to worry about who I'm going to vote for in November. Well, you know, if people really, really if you really believe Jesus is going to come again any time, and you really, really wanted that, I tell you what, it would look a lot different than it looks for just about all of us. It looked a lot different. They had a sense of urgency because they anticipated the coming again of Christ. And, and because of that, they poured themselves into eternal things. And, and if you're going to pour yourself into eternal things, there are a couple of eternal things. People, and that's where you see a whole lot, and they were pouring themselves into the needs of those people. People are going to always last longer than a latte, go a little deeper than a new vehicle. And material things aren't bad, but God says the things that last are people and His Word. So whenever possible, we ought to invest in people and in the Word of God going forth. What about talents? Use your talents. You have gifts and abilities to serve God and where are you using that for God in a tangible way? And, and for so many people, it's, well, pfft, service. I, I thought that meant serve us. 
I thought that meant be a con- I'm a consumer of spiritual goods. That's what I do. Oh, what a sad waste of your life when God's built so much great stuff into you. So, you know, maybe have some extra time to invest somewhere in caring for other people or in sharing Jesus or in expanding the work of your church. One Christ- Christian statesman I found, uh, it was a part of a poem that became a song, and I will not poem it or sing it for you, but uh, about a hundred years ago he said, there's only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So while Jesus is creating this vision for this thing called the church, back in the Sermon on the Mount, comes earlier in his ministry, he said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My life is not going to last that long. And I want my heart and I want my treasure to be leaning toward the kingdom of God because it's going to last a very long time. And that's where I want my investments to be placed. The church is where your time, your talent, and your treasure get invested for eternity. Now, this fifth devotion, and it's a compelling devotion, is explained at the very end of the passage in uh, verse 47. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Jesus invited others, uh, they invited others to join and join them in the church. Now, who wouldn't want to be a part of something where people are genuine and authentic and where God is getting the credit and people are becoming more kind and more generous and inviting people to church was easy because the people love their church. The church is where people get adopted into God's family. And the first church lived in this reality that they were entrusted with this message of the gospel, this good news, and they knew the difference it was making in their lives. And by the way, if the gospel is not making a difference in your life, you may just need the gospel. That may be where the breakdown on this thing is. But if you have really experienced this life-changing power of Jesus Christ in your life, there's something you're probably going to want to share with somebody else. It ought to be evident in you. It ought to be a part of your passion. They had the privilege of telling people that God loved them. Jesus died on the cross for them, and they could have an eternal relationship with God. Paul wrote about it this way. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, separated from him by our sin. In Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That this comes to us then. It's our turn. We take this incredible message, and we... We introduce other people to Jesus. That was their message. It's our message. The reason this message is being shared with you today is because I really want our church to be like this church. And I think it's possible because I've seen it happen in a church. And we're committed to working. It's authentic community and not just hanging out for an hour and then we're done with each other, but really going through life together and and. A church that worships God wholeheartedly and growing spiritually, investing in positive eternal priorities, inviting our family, our friends, our neighbors, our community, the world to become a part of His family. This is what we're trying to accomplish, and we're going to focus on it together. We always move better and focus better and grow better when we do it together. So here's some things for you to consider. Every believer in Jesus Christ needs to be a part of a family of faith, a church. And not, not a drift in and out part of it. You, you wouldn't consider that a close family member. A close family member is someone you, you really spend time with and you're loving them and they're loving you and you're growing together. Sometimes you're, you're uh, rubbing some calluses on one another because you don't always get along just perfectly, but you're growing through that. You're getting better at it. God's doing some things in your character through those times. But if you're not a part of a church family, we'd invite you to be a part of our church family. Some people would say, you know, there was a time in my life I was a whole lot closer to God than I am right now. There was a time when I was walking, I was walking just with Jesus, with God's people, but truthfully, maybe my my, my kids got older, got out of the house, and I started drifting away. Maybe it's because my kids became my all-consuming idol in my life, and they became more important to me than God. And as a result, our family just ended up a long way from God and a long way from the things of God. I've drifted from God, and I I know I want to come back to Him. And maybe, maybe you've heard the story about Jesus and what he offers up. And you just like to have that relationship to him. You'd like to know that your sin debt is wiped clear. You know that when you, whenever you die, know you're going to go to heaven. 
and to know that you're walking through this life. And if it is, it is bright and sunny and everything is great, he's walking with you. And if it's a 9-11 kind of day in your personal life, he's walking with you. If you have never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to pray and give your life to Jesus. And I want to lead you in a commitment prayer. And maybe as I'm praying this out loud, maybe you pray it silently after me as a way to say, God, I want to begin a relationship with you. I want to be reconciled with you. So let's bow our heads. If that's your story today, I'd like to receive Jesus Christ. Then maybe you'd pray, Lord Jesus, I'm inviting you into my life today. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior. I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I invite you to save me. I commit to live my life for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the words of that prayer, there's nothing magical about those, but if you prayed that prayer, you meant it with your whole heart, the angels of heaven are rejoicing just now. You're going to wake up tomorrow with a whole new perspective, a whole new life because of Jesus in you. I want to challenge all of you to make a commitment to be here every weekend for the next five weeks. We're going to experience this Be the Church Challenge together going to discover how do we fulfill everything God intends for us individually in the things we do together in these five core devotions of our church. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to preach about each of these five things in the order I talked about today. So we'll spend time in here doing that. Go to your Bible fellowship group. You spend time there. I want to encourage you to be a part of all five of these Sundays. If you're going to be out of town, you can, you can watch the video version. You can watch the good edited version that tells you how good the Cowboys are doing or how bad. It's going to be up there for you. On the, on, it, it pops up, but you catch up. Don't get behind on this. To uh, pick up a copy of this book, this little book. This is mine that, that I've been going through with our staff, and they're available right out here. There's a display with all kinds of great resources and ways to connect with this. You need to get one of these. They're not very expensive. If you have any difficulties picking up one of these books, we will make it available for you. If you are a first-time guest today, and you'll complete that uh, card to let us know you're a first-time guest, and you'll take that card to that desk, we will give you one of these. Because we want you to join us in this. It doesn't mean you have to join our church, but we want you to join us in this journey because you're not going to really understand church till you get this right. So this is a great opportunity for you as a guest to join with us in this particular effort. By the way, so the way this works, we're doing this differently than we've done these coordinated campaigns before with the devotional book. We want you to start reading your book tomorrow. So you'll be reading about community all this week, and then I'm going to preach about it, and you're going to talk about it in your class, so you're prepared for the discussion. You're not just walking in and saying, I wonder what the teacher's going to talk about today, because you will be prepped and ready, and it's going to be an engaging conversation when you jump into it. So be a part of that, and be a part of, and by the way, if you're not in a group right now, sign up right back here. We'll get you into a group. This is a great time to put your toe in the water and see how that works and see what it'd be like, and maybe, maybe it may go a whole lot longer than five weeks. If you're going through this book every day, it is a short devotional. It's really engaging. Short devotional with application points each day. Something you do about it each day. Not just, oh, that was a good thing. And boy, I never knew that uh, Mount Tabor was so high. Well, congratulations on your Bible study day, but you just wasted some of God's time if that's all you came away with in your Bible study. You better be engaging in something that you're applying to your, to your life that week. So, this book you do this for 30 days, you might be in the habit of doing it beyond 30 days. And that's what we'd hope for in this. And we're praying that God would do some bigger things in us together and individually as a church. So there's your challenge. And I hope you'll join me in it. I really want us to lean into this and see, see just what God might be about on this Lord's Day.